Hello there, and welcome back to the Introduction to English Linguistics. This is session 11, and we're continuing with the topic of semantics. And in this video, I would like to present something to you that is not usually included in introductory courses, but it's something that I consider quite important, namely frame semantics. That's a semantics of understanding. Um, yeah, I'll have more to say about this. Um, last time, I talked about three things, namely metaphor, metonymy, and prototype theory. Starting with metaphor, I explained how metaphor is not a matter of words or a matter of literary, artful language. Rather, it's a matter of thought, and it is pervasive in everyday language. Uh, specifically, I said that metaphor is understanding one thing in terms of another thing. So usually understanding one abstract complicated thing in terms of a simple, well-understood thing. And here's an example. Um, scientific disciplines, that's something that's quite abstract, uh, that we talk about and understand in terms of something more simple, namely space. So a scientific discipline uh, is thought of as an area with boundaries in which you can be situated. And say you're working on two disciplines, and that can be talked about in terms of, yeah, we're, we're crossing the line between um, philosophy and neural science here. Um, if you're changing disciplines, you're moving across boundaries. You used to be somewhere earlier, but now you're here. And if you make a scientific discovery, uh, this can be expressed in uh, sentences like, well, this opens up new areas, new horizons in psychology, etc., etc. Right, um, so metaphor, a cognitive phenomenon, understanding one thing in terms of another thing. Metonymy, that's a little simpler in a way that there's only one semantic domain. And within that semantic domain, there's a semantic shift from one part of the domain to another. For instance, if you have the domain of a human person, uh, there are metonymic expressions that denote a part of a person um, but really allow you to understand the, the whole person. So I see a lot of new faces around here, meaning I see a lot of new people around here. Okay, then prototype theory, um, which is a theory of categorization. Categories um, that I explained was, well, how people perceive the world, how people group things in the world together saying that they're, uh, on some level, they're the same thing. Why does that matter to linguistics? Well, if you think about it, words are representing categories. Uh, something, a word like game, uh, that's a category. There are different things that are games. And on the classical view of categorization, all members of a category should be definable in terms of necessary and sufficient features. I explained that this is highly problematic and one example that I've given is the one of, of game. If you think, well, what are the necessary and sufficient features of game? Let's try and find some. Maybe that there are opponents, that games are played for fun, that there are winners and losers and that you need luck and skills to do well at those games. That allows you to group together a fair number of games, but some games uh, resist. Yeah, uh, so for instance, these baby toddler games, um, there are no opponents, really. Um, some games are played for business, not for fun. Some uh, games have winners and lose, um, ha don't have winners and losers. There's just uh, some kind of social thing going on. And in some games, you don't really need luck or skills. Um, besides, you need luck and skills for many activities that are not games. So if you want to cook a uh, roast beef to perfection, you need a little bit of luck and a lot of skills, but cooking a roast beef, that's not a game in any conventional sense of the word. Right, so the upshot of this is that um, <clears throat> categories are organized in a prototype like fashion with a good or central example at the center and with more marginal yeah, uh, 
less good examples at uh, towards the outside of the category. So all of these birds that you see on the slide, they share certain features, but crucially, not all features, and so these features are not necessary and sufficient in the classical sense. Categories are not um, discrete, they are fuzzy. That's the take-home message there. And that brings us to today's topic, namely frame semantics. And to get started, to, to flex your um, semantic analysis muscles, um, try and, you know, pause this video and define one of the following terms, Friday, vacation, or penalty shot, and try to do so in terms of necessary and sufficient features. All right, uh, ready, set, go, and I'll continue. Okay, um, what I discussed last time was that the meaning of many linguistic forms is quite impossible to define on the basis of necessary and sufficient features. Just discussed the example of game. Last time I also discussed the example of lie. Um, so, and, and frame semantics is an approach to the study of meaning that does not operate on the basis of necessary and sufficient features, but rather it characterizes the meaning of words as relative to a semantic frame. Now, what's a semantic frame? Well, frames are really the stuff of life, a recurrent event or situations, things that you do all the time, like um, well, football, that's a frame, football match, uh, going to a restaurant, that's a frame, working a day job is a frame, changing diapers is a frame, talking on the telephone is a frame, uh, breakfast is a frame, um, mowing the lawn. <laughs> so you get the idea. These kinds of um, yeah, activities that are recurring that you do all the time. Now, the meanings of words denote parts of frames. It's not that a word has meaning all in itself. Rather, a word is a pointer towards a common situation that you live and relive in your daily life. So the meaning of Friday is part of the frame week, and the concept week in turn is part of the frame Roman calendar system. <laughs> um, so you all know about you know, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, and so on and so forth, January, February. Uh, that's no big mystery to you, but talk about this to a four-year-old child and be surprised how this is not at all you know, self-evident. Um, um, yeah, it's a cultural convention, it all hangs together, and in order to understand Friday, you need to have a huge backdrop of information that allows you to, you know, understand, okay, that's Friday, that's what it is. It's before the week, TGIF. Um, so, in the Roman calendar system, the passage of time is divided into seven-day intervals, and the fifth day of these intervals is called Friday. Vacation, one of my favorite concepts. Um, the meaning of vacation is part of the frame work life. Okay, maybe not one of your favorite frames. Um, in work life, people carry out activities for which they are paid. Uh, they have the right to interrupt these activities for some time of the year, and often they use this time for travel to other places, commonly with friends and family. That's what vacation is. Um, Try and define vacation in terms of, you know, this is necessary, this is sufficient to get at the meaning of vacation, it's impossible. Um, rather, you have this cultural idea of, yeah, people work for most of the time, and then uh, there are contracts that specify, okay, you get three weeks off, four weeks off, um, and there are special days where you also get time off. That's what vacation is. It's really complicated. Penalty shot, part of the frame football. Maybe I should have uh, chosen a term from baseball, which is notoriously opaque to European um, people. <laughs> yeah, showing all the arbitrariness, the social convention that's inherent in those terms. So football, that's a game. 
and this game this game has rules and if you break the rules uh, there are offenses and these offenses if they're um, outrageous enough they may be penalized by giving the opponent team so that there are teams um, the possibility to aim a shot at the goal yeah that there are goals in football uh, from a certain distance 11 meters meter that is about this long okay for that shot, the time of the game is stopped. It's usually ninety minutes, um, and until the shot is carried out, only the goalkeeper. Yeah, the goalkeeper. You know, that's a special guy. You realize how much information is in this innocent word "penalty shot." Um, it's staggering. You have to know so much to understand "penalty shot." Okay, so frame semantics. As I said, is a semantics of understanding, and the question that it is concerned with is what do hearers have to know in order to understand a word or a sentence? And the point of my examples was they have to understand a whole lot to uh, make sense of words. So understanding vacation necessitates some familiarity with the concept of work life. Um, a common example is uh, hypotenuse. You know, understanding hypotenuse, that's impossible without knowledge of what a triangle is. <clears throat> yeah, so what do words do in terms of frame semantics? Well, words evoke frames. They denote parts of frames, and these parts of frames, um, they allow you to infer the whole frame. It's a bit like, you know, a part of an object can uh, point you towards the rest of the object. Let me try a little experiment here. Uh, okay, okay. Get it? You get it? You get it? That's a part of something? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's a part of a coffee mug. Um, so in this way, a part of a frame lets you understand uh, or, or points you towards the whole frame. Um, take this example here. Julia will open her presents after she has blown out the candles. Um, no question, this is about a birthday. Yeah, The frame is the birthday, and there are words in the sentence, presents, blow out candles, that point you towards this birthday frame. Um, what's in a birthday frame? Well, uh, again, we have to deal with the Roman calendar system. A person has a date of birth. Uh, this date is celebrated each year, usually with family and friends. Um, the person receives presents. Presents are objects that belong to one person first and then to another. Um, and, and there is no other exchange of stuff. Um, the person receives quite often a cake. Uh, there are candles on birthday cakes, the number of which often corresponds to the number of years the person has lived. <laughs> it's a bit like explaining life to a Martian. Um, yeah, and the person is entitled to blowing out those candles. Reading through this stuff makes you realize how arbitrary and odd cultural conventions really are. Funny. Okay, uh, words evoke frames. One more example here. Uh, I corrected the exams on the train. The phrase on the train suggests to you that I corrected the exams on the train that took me where I wanted to go. Um, as part of you know my daily routine. Uh, if I say I corrected the exams on the train, that does not mean that I somehow uh, discovered a train that was being stationed on a spare track and since it seemed nice and inviting and a calm place to correct the exams, I just you know sat down and corrected the exams. No, that's not what it means. Um, public transport, that's another frame. People use public transport buses, trains, whatnot, to get to places. They pay money to receive a ticket that entitles them to a seat. There are stops where people get on and off. Um, and while using those means of public transport, people can engage in recreational or professional activities. Most are checking their smartphones uh, to see what other people are updating uh, with their smartphones. Okay, Knowledge of frames and uh, is what allows people to understand words. Your experience with the world allows you to make sense of the words that you hear. Um, so, um, the frame of football goes along with a lot of, of words. Goal, offside, penalty shot, referee, goalie, corner, foul, and so on and so forth. And even if you don't really know what offside 
means. There are people who don't know what offside means. They still know that it's uh, tied to the frame of football. So what they understand is, yeah, yeah, it's something to do with football. Um, the frame of marriage, wedding, bride, best man, engagement, divorce, alimony, widow, none of these make any sense if you don't know uh, about the cultural convention of marriage. Or the frame of hand, it's a more simple example. A hand has a knuckle, a thumb, an index, a palm, a pinky, and so on and so forth. Those are the parts of a hand, and um, you can't really understand these terms without knowing what a hand is. So, frames, the situations that you uh, live and, and relive in daily life, they have elements. Um, yeah. Um, so, for instance, the going to a restaurant frame, that's one famous frame that has, getting, has been getting a lot of attention. Um, there is a customer, a waiter, food and drink. There's a check that you get at the end of the experience, and there's an exchange of money and a tip from the customer to the waiter. Uh, in a commercial transaction frame, there's a seller, a buyer, goods, uh, exchange of money, and uh, all of these <clears throat> make up the commercial transaction frame. Um, now, another little exercise here for you to do. Uh, what are the frame elements of cure? Yeah. Uh, pause this video for a little bit and uh, try to write down what elements are necessary in the frame of cure. Okay, here we are again. Um, what are the frame elements of cure? Well, um, there are two things that you need in order to understand cure, and that is the concept of a patient. Um, the patient has a disease. <clears throat> so, patient with a disease, disease going away, that is the basic way to understand what cure means. But there are also optional elements that form part of the cure frame, namely a healer on the one hand and a treatment on the other. When I talked about valency, I mentioned the concept of semantic valency, the situations that are evoked by, well, the, the participants that are evoked by a verb and its meaning. So you could um, argue here, okay, the verb cure evokes a number of participants corresponding to a patient, a disease, a healer, and a treatment. That's the semantic valency of this word. And uh, in a sentence such as, Dr. Smith cured Frank of his depression with acupuncture. You see that, okay, Dr. Smith um, that's the healer, uh, occurs in um, subject position, frank occurs in object position, and then depression and acupuncture occur in syntactically more marginal positions. Um, what are the frame elements of smuggle? Another uh, verb evoking uh, participants. If you want to do this for yourself, do it now. Uh, I'm going to continue. Smuggle requires you to understand that there's a perpetrator, somebody who's smuggling, a smuggler. There are goods that are being smuggled. There's a goal towards uh, the goods are being smuggled. So you don't just smuggle stuff around. Uh, you smuggle it somewhere. And optionally, there's a source and a path. So in a sentence such as Frank smuggled drugs into the prison, you have the perpetrator, the goods, and the goal. But um, <clears throat> language allows you to highlight different parts of frames. Um, so uh, besides Frank smuggled drugs into the prison, you could have sentences like more and more drugs are smuggled out of Brazil. There's no perpetrator, no, no goal, uh, no path. The drugs were smuggled through a narrow tunnel. No perpetrator, no goal, no source. And in uh, the tunnel was used for smuggling, there is really no perpetrator, no goods, no goal, and no source. But crucially, um, with you know the semantic valency of smuggle being this, these five frame elements, they form part of your, your cognitive background, your understanding of the word smuggling. So they're there, even though they're not expressed. 
Right. Um, frames are furthermore of importance because they impose a certain kind of perspective on an event. Um, so the same event may be presented in different ways that are assuming a different viewpoint. This is kind of like a postmodern view of um, reality, saying that, okay, there's no objective truth out there. Rather, it's how you view reality. Everything that you say is infused with your view of what reality is like. And, well, this is no great conspiracy theory here, but it's rather to show you that in language there are different verbs and different structures that allow you to frame the same situation in different ways. Okay, so um, think of a commercial transaction between John and Mary involving a book and a hundred dollars. I can express this idea in at least these four different ways here. Uh, John sold the book to Mary for a hundred dollars. Mary bought the book from John for a hundred dollars. Mary paid John a hundred dollars for the book. John collected a hundred dollars for the book from Mary. So um, in the first sentence, John sold the book to Mary for a hundred dollars. There, the sum that was paid, the payment, uh, appears in the syntactically very marginal position, yeah, as an adjunct. Um, <clears throat> um, in the last sentence, uh, John collected a hundred dollars for the book from Mary. There, it's quite different. Yeah, there, the hundred dollars have a central importance. So, depending on the perspective that you take. Um, different frame elements are highlighted and appear in a syntactically prominent position, such as subject or object. So the verbs buy and sell evoke the same frame, the commercial transaction frame, but they differ in their portrayal of the participants. So in buy, the buyer is the one who is active and controlling the event, and in sell, the seller is the one who is active and controlling the event. So that's something that you're communicating. Yeah? Uh, when you say John bought the book from Mary or John, uh, Mary sold the book to John, um, you don't have to spell it out. It's there, conveyed by the verbs that you're choosing. Right. Um, another little contrast of examples here that I want to show you. Um, in, compare the sentences, in 10 minutes we'll reach the coast and in 10 minutes we'll reach the shore. Yeah. Um, what's that all about? Um, so both coast and shore refer to the space where the water meets the land. But in one case um, you're coming from the land. Yeah. Um, and in the other case, you're on a boat and um, moving towards uh, the land. Um, the second pair of examples here, that day Captain Miller stayed on land and that day Captain Miller stayed on the ground, they denote the same thing. Yeah? Somebody staying where they are on solid ground. But uh, if you stay on land, that means that usually you go out uh, on a boat, whereas when you stay on the ground, that means you usually go up in the air with a plane. Okay, frames reflect cultural practices. I think this was uh, obvious already from the discussion of football and vacation and marriage and whatnot. Um, the recurrent situations that shape our daily lives are piece of our cultural environment. Yeah, marriage, football, Baseball, for those who are you know, in, in, in North American culture, work life, using public transportation, going to a restaurant, something like taking out liability insurance. <laughs> yeah, it's a highly uh, conventionalized practice that you have to be familiar with in order to understand the word liability. Um, and then, more interestingly, uh, Basic syntactic patterns reflect basic syntactic frames. Um, why are there certain grammatical constructions in a language? Well, it's because these basic sentence types 
reflect basic semantic situations that happen over and over again. So, um, for instance, the ditransitive construction with a subject, a verb, a first object, and a second object. Um, this is a very basic syntactic pattern and it reflects a very basic semantic phenomenon, namely a transfer of an object from person one to person two. Yeah? Um, form a sentence with a subject, a verb, one object, another object. Usually what people come up with is um, John gave Mary a book. Not only linguists, but uh, lay people. Um, and if you think of others, John taught Mary French. John faxed Mary the news. John bequeathed Mary a gold watch. All of these have to do with transfer. So I challenge you to come up with examples that have the syntactic form but do not um, convey the idea of a transfer. There are examples. Um, what further evidence is there? Well, uh, there are ditransitives that have this form um, and the meaning of the word is non-existent because, well, they're made up, made up verbs like Grandma crutched Mary the ball. The way people understand the sentence is that Grandma used the crutch to transfer the ball uh, from herself to Mary. Yeah. So the meaning is inherent in this syntactic pattern. Okay, uh, we're moving on to more cultural matters. Frames are culturally contested. Um, so when you are discussing an abstract situation, the frame you choose um, says a lot about you know what you were thinking about the situation. So for instance, if you watch how politicians talk about taxation, you know, taxation, that's um, again a, a cultural convention, social convention that you have to um, give to the state a certain amount of your earnings. Um, how do you talk about this? Um, well, some politicians talk about tax relief and that implies that tax really is a burden. There is a protagonist, the taxpayer, who carries that burden and politicians have the power to make this burden lighter. They can offer tax relief. Let me help you. Let me help you. I'm gonna take this, yeah? Uh, you don't have to, no, 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 no. It's too heavy for you. Um, so politicians give the protagonist relief and um, anybody who's trying to stop the politician from offering this tax relief is actually acting against the protagonist. <laughs> um, what this tax relief story um, obfuscates, you know, what, what it doesn't tell you is that, well, you know, these taxes are actually kind of useful for building roads and, you know, hospitals and um, whatnot. So these el there are elements of taxation that are not represented in the frame. The benefits that come from taxation um, and taxes as investments into future well-being. Um, yeah, and it would be up to the politicians who want to highlight these uh, aspects of taxation to come up with a metaphor or come up with a story that highlights these aspects but not those uh, burden-like aspects. In summary then, um, frame semantics. Uh, words evoke frames and denote parts of frames. So bride denotes an important participant of the marriage frame. Knowledge of frames allows us to understand words and words, so to speak, get their meanings from frames. Um, so the word hypotenuse does not make any sense without knowledge of uh, triangles. And um, okay, so you're by now an expert in many linguistic concepts, and I'm sure you have friends who are non-linguists. We all do. Um, now words like morpheme, derivational, uh, suffix, <clears throat> syntactic constituent, um, all of these do not really make sense to your non-linguist friends because they don't have the frames that would allow them to understand these words. 
um, frames impose a particular perspective on a situation. So think of the contrast. In 10 minutes, we'll reach the shore. In 10 minutes, we'll reach the coast. There's a perspective inherent in your use of words like shore and coast. Frames typically reflect cultural practices like marriage, football, or the Roman calendar. And some sentence patterns of English reflect semantic frames, like the ditransitive construction. And then lastly, frames are culturally contested, like the concept of tax relief. All right, that was it for today, and I'll see you next week.